Hey everybody and welcome back to the channel. In this video we're taking a second look at our Siemens PCD5H desktop PC. And as you can see it has gotten a little bit of a multimedia upgrade. We've got the nice speakers, we have a sound card and we've added a CD-ROM drive. Now what I wanted to do with this video is to showcase what you would do with a computer like this in the 90s. And I'm not only going to focus on PC gaming, but I'm also going to be looking at these typical 90s applications that we were running back in the day. Going from web browsing to email to music to all kinds of stuff. So yeah, definitely stay tuned for that. Now, upgrading the PC was very straightforward. All we needed was to have an IDE CD-ROM drive that we could slide into this available drive bay here and then find the appropriate IDE cable to hook it up. Because it becomes clear when we take a look at the IDE cable that was provided with this PC that this was not meant to include a CD-ROM drive. Now, luckily we have a quick fix for that. Just pick up a new IDE cable, hook it up and use it on our CD-ROM drive. For the sound, I opted for this Sound Blaster Aw64, the CT4500, a nice card from a Creative 16-bit ISA from 1997. So all we need to do is slide this right on in here on top of our 3Com networking card, which was already in the PC. And this gives us network connectivity. We have sound with the sound card and we can load up software using the optical drive. Now, the first thing that I wanted to do is to get a new version of Windows 95 on it, have a clean install. Now this computer already came with Windows 95. It was a Dutch version. So I copied the English Windows 95 install files onto the hard drive. And then I just loaded up a DOS prompt, loaded up smart drive, and then just deleting the MS Office, the program files, and the Windows folder on this PC so that we can start a new Windows 95 setup on this machine. I figured this would be the easiest way to do it. There's no need to reformat the drive or anything. So yeah, so this should be a quick install. Now, quick install needs to be taken with a grain of salt in 1996. I mean, it does take a while to install Windows 95 on a Pentium 75. You need to go through lots of steps. It analyzes the computer. You need to fill in some data. And it does take a fair bit before it is able to copy all of the files from the Windows 95 installation onto the hard drive. But yeah, still it's nice to see these old splash screens here during the Windows 95 setup and to see it getting ready to run Windows 95 for the first time with the iconic background here with the CD-ROM drive, the Microsoft natural keyboard and the Microsoft mouse. We've got the network password prompt, so that's already good, meaning that it has found our networking card. Now it needs to set up some hardware, plug and play devices. God only knows what it's doing internally at this point. It does take a fair bit but our patience will be rewarded soon. All we need to do now is set up some regional settings, set up a printer, and then we've reached the final stages where we can do one last reboot and hopefully enter the Windows 95 desktop. I mean, just look at this Windows 95 loading screen here with Microsoft Internet Explorer. This is Windows 95 osr2 release so this came with microsoft internet explorer 3.0 and we get the networking prompt so let's just log in we hear the beautiful windows 95 startup sound and we have entered the desktop so yeah everything seems to be running fine all we need to do now is do some bookkeeping so let's take a look at the device manager it has found our cd-rom drive it has found our display adapter, ET4000, our 3Com networking adapter, and our Sound Blaster AW64. So everything is installed out of the box, so that's really good. Now to get it onto the network, we're gonna be installing the Microsoft TCP IP protocol, enable file sharing, and then do one quick reboot. And then hopefully we get the computer on the network and we can start exchanging some files, or at least that's what I thought, because after the reboot, 
I was greeted with this rather unfortunate message that the DHCP client was unable to obtain an IP network address from a DHCP server. So that obviously means that there is a problem with my networking card. But that's a bit strange because in device manager, the three com card listed here seems to be running fine. So all the drivers are okay. But when you go into the resources tab of the networking card, all of a sudden you see that the IO and the uh, interrupt request are overlapping with the sound card. So yeah, that's 1990s plug and play for you. Everything seems to be running fine, but it's simply not working. And because this is all plug and play, it's not like we can configure our networking card using the 3Com software because the IO address and the IRQ levels cannot be modified here. There is some kind of auto configure that you can do here and I did try that, but the networking card still failed in Windows 95, despite the fact that these test results seem to indicate otherwise. And of course, because this card is configured for plug and play, we just cannot change the IO address and the IRQ level here in this setup utility. No, no, no. For that, we need to go into Windows again and change it there. Which, you know, is not that big of a deal, but obviously you need to know what you're doing. You need to know how to change these IRQs, what they're all about, and also change IO addresses. So... Yeah, I mean, for something which is called plug and play, you would actually expect that these things just work out of the box, but that was definitely not the case in the 90s. But, you know, that being said, once I uh, changed the networking card parameters to in available IRQ and IO, I did got this uh, message here that the DHCP client now successfully released an IP address and my network was up and running. So as soon as I launched the network neighborhood i could see some familiar devices here so that's already looking good okay so now that we have the network connectivity up and running and we have the multimedia up and running let's install our first piece of software <laughs> and for that i've decided to install microsoft plus now, Microsoft Plus was an uh, expansion of Windows 95, giving you lots of additional desktop themes and sounds and backgrounds. And it was also a place where Microsoft could promote the Microsoft Home brand, where they had lots of multimedia oriented software. And uh, they uh, basically have this catalog here where they showcase all of the software. So yeah, it's like a little time machine back into the 90s where you see all of that iconic pieces of software coming from Microsoft in the 90s. Stuff like Road Atlas, uh, Encarta, uh, MS Dogs, Microsoft Bob, Dangerous Creatures, but also office related stuff like Microsoft Works got showcased here amongst the other multimedia stuff. Microsoft Bob gives you and your household essential programs for home computing. But now back to Microsoft Plus and let's install this great piece of software here. Setup is pretty straightforward, just hitting next, 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 finish. And when the installation is completed, we are dropped into the desktop themes window where we can select a brand new Microsoft Windows theme. For example, dangerous creatures here. Just look how long it takes to import that background JPEG. But then you are greeted with this gorgeous desktop background and basically all of the icons that have changed the colors, the fonts and also the sounds. So, yeah, this was really cool back in the day that you could kind of personalize your Windows environment a bit with these predefined teams. So, yeah, I'm going to go with dangerous creatures for now. I'll probably change it uh, during the course of this video. But, yeah, this is a real blast from the past to see this again. And also when you start Windows 95 with the Microsoft Plus expansion, you see this nice little Microsoft Plus badge here on the splash screen. And then you are greeted with some cool sounds, cool icons and backgrounds. <laughs> 
And, you know, every desktop team had its own set of sounds, which were, <laughs> you know, one was more obnoxious than the other ones. So, yeah, it was really funny to hear these uh, sounds back again as you are clicking around, minimizing, maximizing, closing windows. And yes, yeah, so there were like a whole bunch of themes that you can uh, choose from, which would basically change your entire environment. So, yeah, really cool to see this uh, to see this functionality again in Windows 95. And Microsoft Plus also dramatically enhanced the quality of the various icons in Windows. Just look at this My Computer icon and the networking neighborhood, but also the hard drive and the floppy drive icons, the networking drives. I mean, these were pretty high quality icons back in the day and a big upgrade from the traditional Windows 95 icons. Now, for a lot of people, Microsoft Windows 95 was also a stepping stone to the Internet with Microsoft Internet Explorer 3.0. I mean, just look at how these websites looked back in the, you know, mid 90s. You had lots of animated GIFs, you have lots of marquee style animations, icons which were pretty in your face. And it's just really nice to kind of browse through these sites again in 2022. Just look at this sample that came with Internet Information Server from Windows NT 4.0. It's a real throwback to these kind of mid 90s uh, websites. So, yeah, really cool to revisit them. So, yeah, it was a real exciting era to kind of see what you could do with this new Internet phenomenon. I mean, uh, Microsoft was already aware that it was a lot more than just, you know, putting static web pages on with hyperlinks. They added lots of programming features, database access and stuff like that. So, yeah, it was really, really cool. And this was also the time of the browser wars where you had companies like Netscape who had a huge market share with Netscape Navigator, their browser. But at the time, I mean, Microsoft was really aggressive in pushing its Internet Explorer via Microsoft Windows to the public. And you could clearly see the demise of Netscape as a company and a browser. But still, I mean, it's really cool to kind of, you know, reinstall this kind of old Netscape Navigator software here and just casually browse the web using this browser in Windows 95. I mean, just looking at the about page here, you can clearly see how the Internet looked like in the mid 90s. And now, of course, with the coming of age of the Internet, everybody needed to have an email address and an email client to both receive and send emails. And Eudora was a very popular email client back in the day where, you know, you would have to be fairly technical to set it off. I mean, you needed to know stuff like uh, IP addresses and pop accounts and SMTP addresses and authentication. But yeah, I mean, the fact that you know, there was no real web-based mail. You had to have these kind of desktop applications where you would just configure everything. It uses the POP3 protocol, which basically means that the client would just download the emails from a server, meaning they would no longer be on the server and they would only be within your email client. So yeah, it was a, a, a totally different experience than what we're used to now with all of these web-based uh, email platforms, obviously. But, you know, a nice throwback to see how uh, people were able to communicate with one another using these types of applications. And Eudora was definitely the big player out there with a, a really fancy uh, email client, I mean, for what it was back in the day. You know, the fact that email wasn't just uh, boring text, you could also do fancy markup, have different fonts and colors and even include pictures and attachments. I mean, yeah, this was really, really cool. Now, Microsoft obviously also had to counter that. So packaged with Windows 95 came Microsoft Internet Mail, which was kind of their first big 
internet email package. I mean, this was obviously in a time period where uh, Microsoft was pretty dominant in the office. So they had lots of, you know, exchange mail uh, software. But in terms of internet mail, where you were able to send emails outside of the corporate walls, they had internet mail, which was kind of the precursor to Outlook Express, a very basic uh, email client allowing you to uh, communicate with your friends. So yeah, a very basic application. Obviously you had your inbox, you had your outbox, your sent items. So nothing much changed there. But other than that, it's a very basic uh, application. But because it was packaged with Windows 95, obviously it got a lot of usage and it made life really difficult for other email clients. Now for this setup, I am using a local Microsoft Exchange server to give this demo here, which I will probably do a separate video on. But I also wanted to cover another very popular way of communicating with friends back in the day, and that was ICQ. This is kind of an iconic uh, chat application, which a lot of people used. Now, unfortunately, although you can still download an old version of ICQ, it basically no longer works because the actual servers that were used are no longer online and the program just crashes as you are trying to register your old ICQ number, which probably doesn't even exist anymore. But there is an alternative that you can download, which actually still works. It's a client software combination where you have client software which runs on Windows 95 and a server-side component which runs on Windows NT. It's called ICQ Groupware. So you install the server on your NT workstation or server and then the client on your Windows 95 machine and on the server. What you can basically do there is that you can start server uh, service obviously but you can also create your users here. So here on my Windows NT machine, I'm just going to create three uh, ICQ users with three uh, UIN numbers. So I'm going to pick 1001, 1002, and 1003. And we're going to have a little chat party here on my local uh, Windows network. So as you can see here, we have the three users on my Windows NT. And then on my Windows 95 desktop, I'm just going to uh, register myself using my ICQ number, which is 1001. And then I should have the iconic ICQ application here. So let's see if I can find some virtual friends here on the ICQ network. We're gonna start with Tech Tangent, which is ICQ number 1002. Now, unfortunately, Tech Tangents is offline, but let's send him a message anyway. Perhaps he'll come online in a bit. I'm also going to be adding another friend, which is LGR Clint, also offline, unfortunately. Must be some time zone related thing. But after a while, Tech Tangents here came online and we got the iconic ICQ sound with a welcome message. What's up? So yeah, this was a very popular way to communicate with your friends. And I mean, everybody that I knew had ICQ and you had this really big list of contacts. You could see who was online. You could exchange messages, do chats, exchange files. So yeah, really, really cool time. System message. Oh, let's see what happens here. Oh, LGR has added us to his contact list. I mean, how cool is that? Perhaps he will grace us with a message also. Wouldn't that be cool? Uh -oh. And speak of the devil, here we have it, a message from LGR. Obviously, this is not really LGR. This is just my exchange server playing tricks on you. So let's continue with the rest of the software. Another iconic piece of software was ACDC, which was a very, very popular, you know, image viewer from back in the day that a lot of people had installed, allowing you to browse through your different graphic files and do uh, all kinds of manipulations on them. So yeah, really cool to see that one back again. WinZip is another iconic piece of software that everybody used back in the day. I mean, Zip Archives was the de facto standard for exchanging compressed information. Obviously, everybody had the unregistered version of WinZip, but it was fairly easy to kind of register your own version. And now that we finally had some computing power with this Intel Pentium CPU generation, we could do some serious image editing 
and software like PaintShop Pro 5 was really popular back in the day to do that image editing. It was a basically a free image editing tool um, giving you Photoshop-like functionality, allowing you to not only open but also edit various uh, graphical file formats. And moving to the sound department where who could forget software like Goldwave allowing you to not only play but also edit wave files which was the de facto standard of you know music files sound files in Windows 95. But when talking about sound or music we cannot omit a win amp obviously the most popular mp3 player out there at the time so uh, not only did it have great support for you know playing this kind of new mp3 uh, format uh, which created this whole ecosystem of you know uh, cd ripping software and people creating their own private little mp3 collections and you know had cool visualizations was just a cool piece of software a great uh, plugin ecosystem as well. I think Winamp.com actually still exists and they're busy kind of recreating that iconic MP3 player. So yeah, some really fond memories of Winamp. Other utilities that I remember are Windows Commander. I was not really a power user um, in any sense. I knew a lot of people who really preferred using Windows Commander versus the standard Windows Explorer. I never really had an issue with Windows Explorer, but I can imagine, you know, this kind of dual split screen setup can be handy for working with files. Real audio player also, you know, a big player in the internet uh, scene, starting out with uh, audio only, with the real audio uh, software, then moving into video as well. So yeah, this was really one of those first applications that kind of popularized, you know, audio and video over the internet. So yeah, really cool to see these applications uh, back alive again here. Okay, so next up is perhaps the world's most famous screensaver ever released. I'm pretty sure that most of you who were running Windows 95 back in the day have seen this or installed it on your own machine. And that's the Dancing Baby Screensaver. Came on its own CD but was uh, shared often uh, over the internet. And um, so yeah, it was really fun to to stumble upon this on archive.org so you could basically just download the complete dancing baby CD-ROM which features all kinds of you know not only uh, video files but also audio files to see that dancing baby in action. Sounds really wrong but back in the day this was the most popular screensaver ever. Now, by the end of 1997, I imagine lots of people out there got this CD-ROM in their CD-ROM drive. And that was the Microsoft Internet Explorer 4.0 CD-ROM drive. This was probably one of the most important browsers for Microsoft as it really dominated their position in the you know, internet uh, browsing space. This CD came with every magazine every book every place where they could possibly distribute it it got distributed and this is how it ended up on lots of you know early windows 95 computers who still didn't get the internet explorer 4 because obviously later on it got shipped by default and you know being released in the end of 1997 by looking at this graph you can see how much effect this internet explorer 4 browser had on the overall dominance of microsoft in the browser space and it did introduce a lot of proprietary microsoft technology in the web space meaning that you know it could do things that other browsers didn't do and you had the whole issue of browser compatibility back in the day where you know if you were to develop a site in 1998 or 1999 you could specifically target a specific browser like internet explorer and simply not make it work on something like netscape so yeah, hugely popular browser. I still remember this animated about screen here. Microsoft Internet Explorer 4.0. 
Now, this also came with its own email clients. So this was when a lot of people were introduced to Microsoft Outlook Express, not really related to Microsoft Outlook. It did share a couple of concepts, but it was a completely different software application. It took over your settings from your Microsoft Internet Mail if you used that before. But yeah, Outlook Express also became a very popular uh, email client allowing you to import stuff from stuff like Eudora or Netscape Mail, making it very easy for users to migrate to Microsoft mm -hmm. Outlook Express. So yeah, a clear evolution of the original Microsoft Internet Mail package. It had a lot more uh, features. It was a lot nicer to work with. You could create folder structures, different uh, tree style folder structures. You could have multiple accounts. So yeah, a lot of people uh, used that back in the day. So yeah, that about wraps it up for this video on the Siemens PC, the multimedia converted PC with Windows 95 and its associated software. I really hope you've enjoyed this little throwback in time where we covered lots of popular applications from, you know, the mid 90s up to 1997, 1998. Windows 95, Microsoft Plus, Netscape, Real Player, Internet Explorer, they all have a special place in my heart as uh, software goes. So I really hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope you've enjoyed this computer. It was a lot of fun to make. I'm going to do another video specifically targeting email configuration using Windows NT and Windows Exchange Server. So that should also be fun. But for now, I'm going to leave you in the capable hands of Duke Nukem 3D. Just enjoyed that cool little intro music here from the Duke Nukem 3D game. Really hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider giving it a like. Drop a comment below in the comment section. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. And I hope to see you guys very soon in the next video. Bye-bye.